And then, you know, our bodies are constantly making, you know, your skin changes, I think they say every seven days. So, uh, and your whole body changes. Actually, it's brand new every seven years, organs and everything. Well, if you're speaking into your DNA for that period of time, taking communion and doing all that, you are basically rewiring yourself into the way you think, all those triggers in your DNA and everything like that. So all of this is part of it. So I just really encourage you, and I'll do that little advertisement for you, Mike, that, that uh, and then of course there's this website that you can actually download and, and purchase a lot of like conferences like this or teachers and stuff. And then if you want to be on the very cutting edge, you click on this little thing, Sunday sermon, our latest sermon. And I get on there about 2 o'clock in the afternoon on Sundays because I know it's just been posted and I can listen to it right away and uh, get all the newest stuff that Mike's releasing at that time. So that's another one you can do. Um, so take advantage of that. It's awesome. But no more from me. Let's hear from you, Mike. This is uh, usually the, what speakers call the graveyard shift. <laughs> so if you uh, have a nice full stomach and you just want to drift off into a lovely sleep, that's fine. <laughs> you don't have a squirt gun? You don't have a squirt gun? <laughs> no, I've got no squirt gun. Have you had a place to go this week? No? The rest from your, your, your spirit is still hearing what's being said. Because your spirit's not ever asleep. So, I don't get offended by it. If you start storing, then maybe someone will be able to make it. Everybody goes, you just get to join us, right? If everybody goes, you just get to join us. Well, I'm going to continue sort of building a sort of foundation for what you do. Um, we looked at engaging the art, coming into the presence of God every day and finding out what his purpose and his will and how you frame that purpose so that you can begin to engage uh, the desire of your heart. But then, you know, what do you actually do? Where do you go? How do you work it? There's a, there's a process. You will start out mature. You'll start out babies and whatever. But as we grow, we can mature into those things. So Zechariah 3, 6 and 7. Um, this was talking about Joshua. Joshua was the high priest in Israel, but he was standing in heaven in a court. And the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the Lord of the angel armies, in other words, it says, If, that's the opportune word, that little two-letter word, if, which is a huge word, if you walk in my ways, and if you will perform my laws, my service, or my charge, the conversion state of things, then you will also govern and rule my house, and also have charge of my courts, and I will grant you free access among those who stand with you, in the assemblies of God and the realms of heaven. So there's a process. It's not automatic. You have to follow the process, and there are a few ifs there which are conditional. If you don't do this, then this will happen. So, in reality, you can be on the throne of your life. Your life is a, a place of authority and acting, and you have a scroll. A scroll of your destiny, which is what you're called to do. But if you're seated on that throne yourself, then there can be no seat of rest in government. Because we can't rule in our own strength. So we have to learn to rule differently. So the thing you need to do, and I understand that it's coming from a, a, a monarchy. You know, you don't have too many presidents that give up. It's been one notorious one. Um, but generally, there's a thing called application. And you have to abdicate the position of government that you have, because you have free will, it's your life, and surrender it to God. Now, we know about this because in 1936, we have a king who abdicated it. Actually, it's um, the US's fault because they sent a lady over. <laughs> we happened to fall for And uh, it wasn't very, very uh, 
politically correct, let's say, to our establishment, and they uh, forced him to abdicate. So, but he abdicated a lot, which is not such a bad thing. Um, and actually, it changed the course of our history. And I think God's hand is very much in because we went went into the Second World War, and uh, and our Queen, um, who was would have not been of the line to succeed, um, yeah, she she is a believer, and when she succeeded in 1953, um, then she asked God for wisdom and help from her rule, and she's still going. Her son, who was invested with authority in 1970 in Carnarvon Castle, is still waiting. <laughs> <laughs> it's Prince of Wales. And she doesn't have any sign giving up yet. Um, so, application is a, it's a serious thing because um, you're letting go of your position of authority and you're giving it to somebody else. And so, when Jesus is Lord and you surrender to that Lordship, then you have a seat of rest and government. As a position of rest because you know him under his authority, and he then brings you into your authority. Because if he's in you on your throne and you're in him, then you must be in him in you and in him in him. So you're also in heaven, in a heavenly authority, but also you he is training you to rule in your own life. Because he doesn't just want to sit on that throne and tell you what to do throughout life. Right. He wants you to mature to a place where you choose to do the right things because you, know, yeah. you want to serve him, because you want to do it his way. So there's a process you have to go through. And often when we begin to surrender to the Lordship of Jesus, that's when he starts to train us, disciple us, transform us, testing. And often these sort of big red words come into our life. Trials, tribulations, and troubles. James says, count it all joy, brothers, <laughs> when you encounter various trials. Yeah. And now the end result of those trials, if you embrace them and don't avoid them, is that you'll be perfect, complete, and lacking in nothing. Yeah. Well, who wants to be perfect, complete, and lacking in nothing? All of us, I imagine. <laughs> so let's embrace the trials, because they're opportunities to grow, and to subdue, and to rule, which is exactly what Adam and Eve were given a mandate to do. We're not ever going to do that in the world if we can't do it in our own lives. So we have to learn to bring the government of God into our own lives so we can begin to rule. But there are lots of tests and trials and things that come along to highlight where we actually are rather than where we think we are. Because when everything's wonderful, mankind has a habit of being comfortable. And everything's great, well, why change anything that's good? Well, because the best is yet to come. Yeah. So if you want to be staying in the good, you're going to miss the best. So God doesn't really want us to be too comfortable. He wants us to be on a journey. You know, we're supposed to be pioneers and not settlers. That's God's desire for us, to be pioneers, not settlers. So not be comfortable, but always willing to be changed, because there's no end to the increase of his government. So there's no end to the increase of what he wants to bring us into. Um, for our transformation, we're going to be transformed and changed from one degree of glory to another into the glory of His image. That's going to take a while, I think. I think it's going to be an overnight change. And it's probably going to go on for a long, long time, or when there is no time. So we need to learn to walk in His ways. And we learn to walk in His ways in this realm. So we can have work his principles and walk according to his word and his truth and his life in this realm. And there's a little process that goes on. When we become Christians, we come into a relationship with God mostly because we've seen we've got a need. And we come and embrace the cross and we embrace salvation and our attitude is usually, I just come to serve. You know, I'm, I'm so grateful to you. And we begin to see some of the works of God around our lives. And sometimes we get to a point where there's a choice. You know, I remember when I was a teenager thinking, I need to make a choice. You know, I can't just sort of be messing around with this, you know, one foot in one camp, one foot in the other. You know, am I going to really do this or not? And I said, yeah, I'm going to make that choice to follow you. 
And in a Hebrew culture, you could be sold into slavery, or you could be sold as a servant to pay off a debt and other things. So, you know, my debt was paid by Jesus. Yeah. But when I choose to accept being his follower, because I don't want to go free, I become bond servant. And when servants were set free, they had a choice. And if they didn't want to be free, they would have their ear bored with a uh, implement and to a doorpost and a ring put in. And that was a sign that these were servants who weren't just there in slavery or to pay off the debt because they chose to serve their master. And they were recognized differently. They were treated differently. Because there was a recognition that these people, they wanted to serve. Now, when we become bond servants and we make that commitment that, hey, we're going to serve God, he recognizes that and he begins to give resources and responsibility and we become stewards. Stewards of those resources. And a steward is, has responsibility for the master's goods and is responsible to use them for the master's purposes of their own. And as we learn to walk in the ways of God, that's when I believe God starts to call us into something else. When we're faithful with little, he starts to call us deeper and deeper. So there's sand that comes, that calls us into friendship. Because we have become so good as stewards, and become so busy doing the things of God, that we actually forget the relationship with him. You know, and a lot of people end up that way. You know, and they end up burnt out and disillusioned and so they put all their life into the stuff there, but they never really entered into the depth of the relationship that God wanted because they were too busy. You know, we've had this recently with a whole load of leaders in our area that you know I've been sharing with for a number of years and God started to speak saying, I want you to give me room. I want you to come into intimacy. You know, and some of them responded to that. And some of them just found it so difficult because they just were so busy. They're so busy keeping things going that they couldn't give God the space. You know? And God wants to encourage us to come into friendship and into consuming relationship. And Jesus said to his disciples, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. And as friends, I'm going to disclose myself in a totally different way. Because a servant will use all the resources God gives and He gives us many things, gifts and abilities and ministry. And sometimes we get our identity from that. We get our identity through what we do. We don't want to give it up because we won't know who we are. Well, the reality is we need to know who we are so that we can be and then do from who we are. So we do things from our relationship with God, not for our relationship. And how much religious service is about serving God because we're doing things for him, because we think he'll love us more. Or if we don't serve him, maybe something will go wrong. You know, and I, years ago, when I used to sort of find a quiet time with God, there was this thing, of, well, if I didn't do it, well, would something go wrong today? And it was almost like a superstition, you know, and you get in a rut, and you get into a religious routine, so this is the relationship. And so God will never bring something bad on you today because you forgot to read the Bible in the morning. That's right. Amen. He's not like that. He's a loving God. He wants to be with us so we can get to know us better and we can get to know him or have a relationship. Yeah. It's never to do with sort of this discipline and punishment that God's waiting for you to get it wrong so he can pounce and put you right. down. Right. That's what the devil presents God like. And to be honest, it's the religious institution that does most of the devil's PR work for you. <laughs> Right. Doesn't really have to do it all lot. We do it all for him. So we present God as yeah. something he isn't. You know, it is the kindness of God that makes these people. Yes, exactly. You know, it isn't his judgment. Because his judgment is just a decision and verdict that says, this isn't right. Choose life. Yeah. And if you choose life, you'll leave that behind. You know, God never punishes anybody. Jesus already took it all, there is no punishment. But God loves us so much, He does want us to change. Yeah. So He draws us into intimacy with Him. And in love, it's so much easier to allow Him to transform us. Because there's no guilt, shame, and condemnation attached to love. Right. Whereas, what does the enemy make us feel? Guilty. That's why Adam and Eve went hid in the bushes, covered up. 
If they had run to God, God would have forgiven them. We wouldn't be in this mess. But what they would have had to have done is have gone through the fiery sword. And that's a bit like scary. So we'll go and hide out and put two things on and cover us up. And none of them have been doing that ever since. Using religious things to make ourselves acceptable to God. Well, how can we possibly be acceptable to God? We can. Other than coming in Christ where he makes us the righteous of God. That's what he does. We just have to give him the raw material and we'll use it. Yeah, so friendship and intimacy is really important. And the whole religious system that's around dead works, and bondage, we need to see that come down. Because God is a loving God who loves us unconditionally. But like I said this morning, he doesn't leave us there because he loves us too much. To leave us as we are, he desperately wants us to change so that we'll come into the blessing and the fullness of who he is. So the Holy Spirit starts to get involved in our lives big time when we come into intimacy. Sometimes that's in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, sometimes that's later, but the Holy Spirit wants to be alongside us, he wants to support us, he wants to fill us with life, but he wants to point us to Jesus, because that's what he does. So the Holy Spirit will bring us to Jesus and they will find that everything goes to a different level. Once we recognize that Jesus is King, Jesus was Lord and we just serve as good stewards. But in friendship, we realize that there is a splendor of the King. And we were singing it last night, the splendor of the King. And it's amazing to serve the King. And when Jesus is King, we become Lords. So we start to have charge of the hands. We start to outwork the principles of the kingdom in authority because we have a lordship. Because Jesus is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And we're the Lords that He's Lord of. And in this process, we're also the King that He's Kings of. So we start to administer the principles of the kingdom, which is when real intimacy comes when we cross the veil. We cross the veil into engaging within our own spirit, because we're engaging the spiritual realm on the inside of us, and we're engaging him in his realm, or across the veil of entry into the realm of heaven. So we can start to administer there from the mountains and the thrones and the things we want to do. And we get to rule the house first, our house, because we're a house of God. So if we don't learn to administer our own house, then we're not likely to be given responsibility for a larger house. And that might be the house of the Lord, that may be a house of our family, could be a house of our workplace, a place of government. So God starts to give us wider authority when we learn faithfully to administer what he's given us to form. And so then Jesus will bring us into another level of authority, which is kingship. Because lords do what the king says. They've given mandates or authorization, legislation to administer. But kings make legislation. So God wants you to begin to judge the courts and operate in the legislative, judicial place of heaven. So you begin to establish God's government. Because he now entrusts you with a whole different level of responsibility. It'll never happen until you begin to administrate your own life. Because, you know, there's a lot of fads go around in the, in the Christian community and people get the buzzwords and, you know, people are asking me all the time, why? What about these benches at three? How do I get on the bench at three? So, you know, my first reaction to that usually is, well, are you on your own mountain? Well, I don't want to talk about that. I want to be on a bench at three. <laughs> you know, actually, it's not going to happen. You know, unless you're faithful in ruling your own house and your own life, why would he give you responsibility for someone else if you're not actually proving that you can do it? So there are it's a progression where as we're faithful with little, he'll give us more and more, and that will expand and expand. So when I am operating in kingship, I get to operate in the court system of heaven, I can go and make legislation in the court kings. I can involve the Chancellor's Court where I can begin to see authorizations released. Totally different dimension of authority. But 
We have to learn how to do it. And then, of course, Jesus is always going to point us to the Father. Because that's what they do. Father sends the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit leads people to Jesus. Jesus leads people to the Father. And it's just a, a wonderful relationship they have. No competition. So when we start to come to the Father, and God is our Father, and He fathers us, which is an amazing thing. Be fathered. You know, I never knew what it was to be fathered. I never knew what it was fathered in the natural realm. I never knew what it was to be fathered in the spiritual realm. Because everyone I came across who was in authority sort of used and abused me. You know, and I was open for that because I traded on that floor because I thought I was going to get promotion by helping the person who was already in charge. That's negative trading. Um, not a good thing to do. You know, I had to repent a lot of some of those motivations. Because I did some things I really seriously regret that. Because someone asked me to do it, so I became their mouthpiece and fired their bullets. And sometimes people will try and get you to do things, but they don't want to do it. Yeah. Yeah, and I was willing because I was inside needing affirmation. But I didn't have any affirmation as a father. So I made decisions to please people based on the need for affirmation in my mind. And that's trading negatively. And there's always negative consequences to that. You know? So I think you know, look at your own heart. You know, I have to look at mine. You know, I recognize that some of my decisions weren't good. So my fathering issues created a need in my life for recognition in other people. So God spoke to me. When God healed my father wound in heaven and removed the scar, Next thing he did the next day, um, Jesus came and said, Are you willing to now deal with your betrayal? Now, I sort of, the previous day, having dealt with my father, and that was amazing. And I thought better about arguing against all the betrayal wounds that I've already dealt with them, because obviously I haven't had any. So I said yes. And he took me through 14 instances in my life, one after the other, of being betrayed. And it went right back to when I was 12 years old. And I had two best friends, the only two guy friends I had, because I went to a school 12 miles away, and none of the other lads went to that school, so there were only two we got on the bus together, and we were friends. And so I was meeting with them on a Saturday, we were messing around, and we decided we were going to make a cart, and make these sort of trolley things with the wheels, and you steer kids play with, and they go down hills really fast. It's very fun. And so we had this plan, and it was this blue and red cart and it had so all, the, all the design and the steering it was great we we're going to do it so my dad was a builder and he said i can get some of the tools and let's, let's do this so then i came and followed a couple of weeks later when we were going to do it and um they sort of we go into their shed and they opened the shed door and they'd already built it wow. and excluded me now i you make all the best of them that's really good but inside you know i didn't set up a passion in my life because essentially i judged it you know, I didn't know about forgiveness at that point. I was just hurt, damaged, disappointed, let down, betrayed. And so I judged that situation and like put a little flag on my head that says, come and betray me. You know, because what you judge comes around on you. And whole my whole life became a series of betrayals. So in my you know school life, I didn't want to get close to anybody because they might betray me again. So I always picked on the new boy in school, um, and I always picked out the persons who were new because I knew that I could be alongside them. It was less likely that I was going to get betrayed. And you find all these motivations when you start looking into your life. You know, and I, I discovered a lot of hidden motivations for some of the things I did when I looked back. Um, you know, so I went through all the betrayal of leaders and people who were close to me and people who betrayed me. You know, it was hard to go through it all, and I forgave them, I released them, you know, as God healed me. And, you know, I always felt alone, even in a group of people. You know, I was always very open about myself. You know, I was self disclosing, I was very happy to talk about myself. I wouldn't close in terms of information, but information is just information. Closeness and relationship is a different thing. So I was always guarded on being close with people. Uh, because of the protection mechanisms and layers I've built up to keep myself safe, or do I agree with threat? No, that's not conscious. 
None of these things you don't think about doing wrong, but you just do them because they're instinctive, because they protect you. So I care people at a distance, um, therefore I could be in a room of people and feel love, and often did. So this was a, a hindrance in doing some stuff I'm doing now. <laughs> so of course, I wanted to deal with it. And so he dealt with the betrayal, and I felt different, and you know, I felt I wasn't alone anymore, and therefore I was able to be more open and more giving emotionally and sharing emotionally rather than just giving facts. You know, I never mind giving facts, but actually you know, sharing your emotions is difficult. Because sometimes people might reject them and tread on them, but actually now I don't feel that way. So God spoke to me and said, right, you know, how would you scale your fathering? And I asked, well, minus 100, let's say. So he said to me, all the healing you've had has brought you back to zero. Now you've got a fresh start. Now I can father you. And being fathered is amazing because he's alongside me. He helps me, encourages me. He corrects me. He guides me. He disciplines me at times so I can become more like him. And it's an amazing thing. You know, I. As an illustration of this, one day, sometimes you look at other people and you judge things by looking at them. So intimacy was one of those things that you, when you hear people talk about intimacy, you have the sort of what I call warm and puzzles. Like, oh, you're intimate, can't you just feel so lovely and warm and cuddly and kindness so of God, right? You know, and I would spend my time in God every day. I didn't necessarily always feel that. Also, feeling worship, that's what that way worship. When I'm engaging with God personally, I didn't feel warm and fuzzy. So I sort of felt, well, maybe I'm not so intimate. Because I was comparing myself to what other people were saying. And God said, Well, how do I love you? Um, well, so I, yeah, yeah, because I was struggling to answer. Because um, I was thinking about, well, this must mean when I feel warm and cuddly, so actually, I'm not sure. So he said, well, when do you feel most fulfilled and satisfied when we've been together? I said, well, when you sit down with me and we talk and you share with things, we reveal things. So he said, well, don't you think that's me loving you? Yeah. And that's a twig about the languages of love. Because he has the five languages of love in marriage. You know, and you have sort of words of affirmation and affection and gifts and quality time and you know, that sort of stuff. So it suddenly sort of occurred to me that you know, other people's languages of love might be different to mine. And it freed me up and brought me to liberty that I just love it when we're together and we're talking. Because he's fathering me, he's sharing things that he knows so that he can inform me and help me. So it's great when I can be a son, you know, and you can't be a son unless you've got a father. You know, so I can do little of that, essentially. And often, many of us have a slavery mentality, you know, because we come out of Egypt, but Egypt never came out of us. And the children of Israel demonstrated that very clearly. By the time they got to the promised land, and we're going to cross over, they thought like slaves, because if they thought like sons, they would have known they had an inheritance as a son, they would have gone into the land and possessed it. But they basically says, no, this isn't for us, so we don't have an inheritance. So we must be illegitimate and slaves. And that's how they thought, because Egypt didn't come out of them. They have 400 years of heritage of being slaves and being told what to do. And even though they came out of Egypt with all the wealth, so their 400 years of wages were given back to them and all the gold and stuff they all had. They actually still thought themselves as slaves, which is why they didn't see that they had inheritance. They didn't believe their identity as a son, and therefore they didn't believe they could go and take the land. Only two people did. Joshua and Caleb were a different spirit. Why? Because they'd spent time lingering in the presence of God. When Moses left to go and do business, Joshua stayed. And he learned sonship. We learn what it was to know the Father. And God wants us all to know his Father. Really to know his Father. And when you do, it transforms everything. 
And so it's been great, you know, my journey has gone on a long, winding trail to find intimacy with God and many steps along that way. But now I can access the acceptance of God because he trusts me as I'm a son. You know, you may give resources to a steward, but it's not the same as trusting as a son. Because a son is an inheritor, a steward is an employee. And many of us stuck, get stuck in being good employees of God and don't learn to become good sons of God. And therefore, know the fullness of our inheritance and all he has for us so that we can actually begin to rule and administer his kingdom. So we get the, the uh, access into the realms of heaven. So this pattern of the tabernacle, inner court, you know, the outer court, inner court, the holy holies, as servants and stewards and friends, we begin to administer that in this realm of the kingdom of earth. And then we get called to come across the veil, come into intimacy, become a lord. That's what we were talking about this morning, coming on to an acting with a position of authority in lordship. So we begin to keep his charge, his laws, his principle, perform our service, begin to start to rule or govern the house in the kingdom of God. And that's the area where there's also some other things up there which we need to deal with. It's an area of light and God. But then we get called to come into the kingdom of heaven. And in the kingdom of heaven, we get access to the courts of God and we start to administrate the kingship. The charge of courts. And then we can go into heaven itself and we can learn kingship there on the throne where we're seated within heavenly places. And actually, he wants to bring us into sonship, which means we can access higher places in the realms of heaven. And heaven ends with his God, his senders of God. Not the denomination. Place, it? <laughs> so, in our own lives, when we are all in the realm of the kingdom of God, we have access to the core of war or strategy, where we get the counsel of God for everything He gives us to do, we get strategy for it by going and engaging that core. Where we can deal with the mobile core, which is the convening, the accusations, and getting court orders and papers to be separate, to be free. To start to see blockages removed, and I'll go into that in another session because it's a really important thing to administrate the court of heaven. And also the court of angels. So we have access for our mandates and to the action. So the angels can start to operate on our behalf. So all of us from that place have certain spheres of authority, which we need to see are our spheres of government. That might be family, workplace, it might be our local area, our street. Our church, our gifting, ministry, there's no end to what those things are. <coughs> the world individually will all have different spheres. Now, as you're faithful to rule those spheres and to begin to administrate those spheres, sometimes he begins to then give us wider spheres. Maybe our locality, so we've got a heart for the city, or a heart for the state, for the region. Sometimes we're called into a prophetic mantle where we start to hear the things of God and begin to decree them and declare them. A business mantle. So many people who are in marketplace ministry, where they're called into the biggest business community, they have authority there, they begin to bring favor and blessing of God into that community. Now, most Christians want to get out of that community and become part of the church. Actually, we need to see that the church is in the community, take part of it, and should be transforming it and changing it. We have some people have a healing calling. They begin to minister healing in different ways. Some people are called to leadership. Some people have inventions. God begins to release revelation from heaven and calls them into releasing technology and things like that to bring blessing and, and finance to the kingdom. Some people have a finance company and they're called to administer finances and be pillars of finance for the kingdom of God. You know, some people think making money is a bad thing. I think it's a very good thing. You know? You know, we need finances in the kingdom, and God gives people an opportunity to make that as long as they're generous with it. Great. So we all have a role to play in God's kingdom, and we have access to different levels of authority depending on where we are. That's the judging or ruling my house. So when we then start to deal with the spiritual opposition of blocks, and therefore, some of our, as I said before, our magic realm is 
caretaken by an angel that's administering on our behalf until we mature. But those other mountains can sometimes have other entities that's called them that block and hinder and rob us. So we have to deal with them when we start to come into authority. And sometimes you see them flying around your mountain and you start to see what they're um, You need to know your authority if you're going to deal with dragons and giants and things that are in that realm. Look, if you know that you know Jesus and he is king, you know that you have authority to rule. And you can establish that law and deal with those things. Then we can start to administer the everlasting doors to the earth. And those are the things that bring the blessing of God through heaven onto earth. Ephesians 1 3 says, Blessed be the God and Father of all Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, empowered us to succeed and prosper in everything He's called us to do. Our whole destiny, we're empowered to succeed. God does not want us to fail. And if we do mess up sometimes, he always gives us another opportunity to have another go. He doesn't remove it from us because the gifts and calls of God are right with both. Our destiny is our destiny. Now, ultimately, if we do not fulfill our destiny in this realm, then there are some serious things that he says. You know, like the five foolish virgins. And there are other things where it indicates that if you bury your talents, um, it's talking about money, but actually talks about just our lives as, a, as God's people, then we can lose something and give it to other people. I mean, I know I'm doing some things now because people have said no. And I've said yes, it's not. It wasn't really just my destiny, I'm fulfilling other people's. Because they said no. You know, I've always had people to say yes. Sometimes it takes a bit longer than others to say that. <laughs> and I have to think about it. but. Every spiritual blessing is in the heaven, is in Christ. So it's all available for us on the other side of the veil. So if we don't go to the other side of the veil, how do we get access to the blessing? Well, we can. We're dependent on God's grace and mercy to pour some of that on us, rather than us coming to administrate them and have the authority to outwork them. Because we've been seated and raised up with Christ in the heaven places. Jesus 2 6. He's raised us up. Yeah. He's lifted us up. He's exalted us to that place where we can be seated in that place of governmental authority so we can administer. Psalm 24, 7, lift up your heads. So let's say we're being called and lifted up into a position of headship authority, only gates. So we're gatekeepers to administrate what comes in and out of our lives. He lifted up the everlasting doors. So as soon as we start to take authority and take position to manage the gates, then the everlasting doors can be opened. Now what happens then? Who comes through those everlasting doors? The King of Glory. It's not about me. It's about releasing God to come and manifest His presence on the earth. The King of Glory shall come in. Who is the King of Glory? The Lord strong and mighty. Who does the battle belong to? The Lord. The battle belongs to the Lord. We just have to line up with them and allow them to fight on our behalf. So heads represents authority, gates represents access points, and the everlasting voice where it touches them. Okay, the righteousness and justice are the foundation of the throne. Mercy and loving kindness and truth go as well. Everything must operate in righteousness, which is actually about love. So everything we do for a position of government always must be done in love. Never in anything else. So we can never look for revenge. We can never look for any of those negative attitudes. It has to be love, otherwise it isn't a kingdom. Because a kingdom is a kingdom of love. And justice. What is justice? Well, when the judge takes a verdict and says, guilty, justice is that person goes to jail. And he's locked up, that's justice. They have to answer the sentence. When the judge says, not guilty, justice is that person goes free. And guess what verdict you get? Not guilty, all the time. Yeah. So justice is administrating that verdict to see freedom come to the earth, to people. Because people are called to be free on the basis of what Jesus did on the cross. Yeah. 
and we have to administrate that justice, which means everyone can come into a relationship with God and intimacy and have these sons. And we do it because there's mercy. God doesn't treat the world as they deserve. He treats them on the basis of what Jesus has done. And love and kindness is covenant love. That's what it means, covenant love. The love that's released in the new covenant. And truth, revelation of who Jesus is, not truth. And they all go before your face because they are what God is looking to release from where he's looking at. God is always looking forward because he has nothing to look back to because he's the beginning. So he always looks forward, so his face is always looking for righteousness and justice, for mercy and loving kindness and truth. And therefore we have more authority in that, because we have a sector that enables us to begin to administer righteousness and justice. So that's why we must have this kingly royal priesthood agreement in heaven, so that we can see the apostolic or the legislative and the prophetic or the oracle to release on the earth, so that we have this reflection on earth. That's what our lives should be, a reflection of heaven and earth. That's where we know we're rooted because that can start to administrate around us. And then each ecclesia will have the same blueprint from God, a destiny that we begin to come together, we will release and not to earth. Now, there's a whole thing with spiritual warfare that people got into and got them into some pretty serious trouble. When the revelation got released that there were certain things in the atmosphere of the earth that we need to deal with, it, because they didn't have the revelation of how to deal with them, they started dealing with them from here. And when you're under something, you can have no authority over it. So you have to be over it. So we have the earth sphere, which we live. We have the atmosphere of the earth, in which there are rulers and principalities and powers and various other things. And you have the heavenly realms. Now, in religious institutions, the only way you could access the heavenly realms was for a covenant of death and to die. Now that's all changing because now people are realizing that we don't have to physically die. A little bit of death to the flesh doesn't do it in this. So we have access to the realms of heavenly realms now. And so the everlasting doors between the earth and the heavenly realms has to go through the atmosphere. And therefore, in the heavenly realms, there are all these mountains, places of authority for us. There are larger mountains and places of authority for leaders and cities and nations. God has got a blueprint for everything. And we have access directly without having to go into the atmosphere because the veil's open. So when we engage that, and we're in that place where we're in the realm of heaven, now we're above the atmosphere. So we're above all the principalities and powers, and everything's there, they're under our feet, which is what Jesus said they should be. For all authority in heaven is given to you, and there you go. He also said, I give you all authority to trample on snakes and scorpions, and they're all under your feet. All the authority of the enemy is under your feet, he said. Nothing is going to hurt. It isn't going to hurt us if we're in the position where it's under our feet. If we're under them, then we're subject to various things we need to be very careful about. And I'm not sure where I told the story last night about what happened with um, Robert Henson when he was teaching about the two ladies in New York. Did I say that last night? Yeah. So be careful what you do from under something. So when you're in the atmosphere of heaven, you're in the heavenly realms, you then have the authority to bring things from heaven to earth, and you have the authority to clear what's under you, because you're above it. So, literally, you can start to bring heaven into that atmosphere. So, those things that are there just get shifted, because you take possession and shift them out. Now, you don't have to do that physically, because you have a whole lot of angels who are there to decide to be to enable you to do it. Yeah. So the atmosphere is clear. Yeah. And if the atmosphere is clear, what can happen then? Everlasting doors can be open. Yeah. So literally, the realm of earth <coughs> and heaven and earth. Yeah. So we rule, and heaven and earth are overlapped again. 
So we have to deal with what's in the atmosphere. To deal with what's in the atmosphere, we have to deal with what's above the atmosphere, around the kingdom of God, and therefore we must deal with things that use their authority from your mountains and thrones, which are called dragons and giants. You know, they're just symbolic of the authority that the enemy has that we give him. Because when you get two things in agreement, it falls an arm. And so when we agree with sin, it gives the enemy the opportunity to manifest that above us. So it's important we understand how to agree to administrate the government of God from heaven and to clear the atmosphere and to establish the kingdom on the earth. So that means it's really important you identify your authority schemes because you can't rule for what you're not in authority in. Right. So whether it's your family, your workplace, church, locality, nation, region, authority to manifest the kingdom, you need to know what it is. Then you can change the atmosphere in your environment in your sphere. You can't change anyone else's atmosphere. Right. Unless you have authority in it. So in terms of my role within the church, in terms of being part of Adventure 3, we have the authority to clear the atmosphere over us as a church. So everyone can come into the blessing of, them, of being in our environment. When they step out of that environment, they have to deal with their own atmosphere. So we provide a way which we can teach them and train them in a place of safety and security of the environment of love, so they can learn how to do these things. Then they can do it every day in their own spheres. So that authority is to destroy the works of the evil one, the devil, because that's what Jesus came to do. But those works are not just the things we see in this realm, they're also the things that are operating in the greater works, the greater realm. So we have authority to subdue and exercise dominion, and we're in a training process in humility. Now, humility is not, I'm nobody or nothing, it's actually, I am a son of God. And when I humble myself under the mighty hand of God, and accept that I'm a son of God with authority and power in his name, because I mean his name, then he exalts me to a position of governmental authority and other power. If I think I'm a servant and a slave, I've got a mindset that I can't do anything, all those giants are so much bigger than me, and I'll never be able to defeat them because I'm a worm. Because that's what the enemy will tell you. So you know, we nothing. Well, actually, God takes the foolish things of the world and confounds the wise. So he's not looking for superstars who think they know everything and they think they can do everything. He's looking for people who just accept that God's called them and given them authority in their mind. And he'll take such people and he will elevate them. Because they're not looking for earthly recognition. Who cares what anyone thinks about us in this realm? But when we're recognized in the heavenly realm, then the angels recognize our authority. The whole host of heaven is available for at work in that authority when we get to administrate it. But we need to accept that we're called into that place. Now, anything that lies to you and says you're not, you have to deal with it. So what do we do when we get to that place of authority? A man, let's say, a place where we're called to administrate all those things around. What do we do in that place? Well, you can't just sit there and play a harp, you know, whistle or tune, you know, there's some stuff you have to do. So we use what's called the keys of the kingdom. Now, the keys of the kingdom are locked and unlock. Now again, there's such sort of mixture in this stuff that you know when people are into spiritual warfare, they're trying to use the keys of the kingdom here. In the authority they had in demons to bind things and get rid of them, they suddenly thought they could do that with the atmosphere of the earth. And you can. Because the keys of the kingdom are not what has been taught in the spiritual warfare. You see, the keys of the kingdom are declarations we make from a place of authority to bind things to God's will. So the binding is not the bad stuff, it's the good stuff. Because you bind things to God's will to his kingdom. And that's why they banned the word of God to their wrists and their heads. They were called phylacteries, because they banned themselves to the outworking of God's word. So binding is not, we're going to bind the strong man so we can cast it out. You have the authority to cast demons out. And this you can forbid them to do what they're doing so you can cast them out. So you can't bind the principality of power, or a ruler, or a wicked force of evil in that realm. And people who tried have ended up being essentially weighed down and heavy and oppressed because they've tried to do it from under. And I heard all this stuff. I went to prayer meetings in the 80s and 90s. And people were screaming at me, shouting out. Hey, I thought, 
the other one dead, so stop. You don't have to shut up. <laughs> And the same thing when casting out demons. Do a screamer. And since they're dead, well, they might be a death without spirit. <laughs> Generally, they hear what you're saying from authority. Screaming and shouting doesn't give you any more authority. You know, just come out in Jesus' name. You know, most of the deliverance we have now is done because we teach people to go to the courts where we remove legal rights and they get set free. Don't have any of this history on it. So we don't any distraction off the glory to God in manifestations. So we used to see lots of manifestations because it was almost like it was a bit like what we do at demon and God might scream. <coughs> no, in reality, you know, a demon's God when you live the fruit of the freedom you've got. Yeah. Yeah. No, so binding to God's will is a key that you can use. You can bind situations and people. In the right way, and I'll explain a bit more about that. When so you're loosing, you're loosing from the restrictions that are hindering God's will in the kingdom. So you can see things, and loosing really needs to demolish, to destroy, and completely demolish it. So you loose situations and people because you can unlock what they're locking up. And then we can start to call things from that realm that we not. In the heavens, as if they are on earth, and we'll begin to manifest that in faith. So we can start to decree and declare as a key of the kingdom to bring change. Now, forgiveness is a real important thing you can do from that realm. And most people really don't understand this. You know? Most people really don't understand forgiveness full stop. Because it's not a mental thing where you say, I forgive. You have to release people from the debts they owe you. So you have to take an account, make an invoice. And actually forgive them and release them. Because forgiveness is such a key principle to the kingdom. And so many people go, and Jesus said, I need to forgive 40 times, 7 times, 7 and 490 times or something. But, well, yeah, if you can do it right, right in the first place. If you do it right in the first place, you only need to do it once. To do it once, you don't just say, I forgive you. You have to do it from your heart, and you have to weigh the cost, and you have to choose to do it. Irrespective of what you feel like, because it's a representation of the gospel. And if you don't forgive, you can't be forgiven, Jesus said. So it's pretty serious stuff. And if you don't forgive, in Matthew 18, Jesus said, you get handed over to the torture. You're in a torture chamber where you're racked, put on a rack. Because unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting someone else to die. You're the only one affected by it. It damages and hurts us not to forgive. And to, to our, we, we have a whole teaching around this because it's such an important thing. All our ministries are based in it. You know, real forgiveness opens up people's lives to be free. And unforgiveness is a key for many, many things in people's lives. And we used to have a, a way of um, helping people to see this and how it works. Now, in our circle, because we work a lot of people with addictions, 10 pounds or 10 dollars would be a very key amount because that would be what a bag of heroin used to cost. And so we would say to people, okay, you do understand this. Someone asks you, can they borrow 10 pounds, 10 dollars? And you say, yeah. And they say, well, I'll pay it back next week. So now they owe you something. And you've agreed that they'll pay it back the next week. So next week comes and they don't pay it back. And they avoid seeing you because they know you. And then they walk on the other side of the street quickly and they don't catch your eye. And you now start to feel actually they promised they were going to pay it back. So now you look at them differently because they owe you something. Not only if they owe you something, they've broken their promise. So you have a choice at this point. You can pursue them to get your money back. And eventually, when they catch up with you, and you catch up with them, and they say, I'm really sorry. I really meant to pay it back, but something came up, and I couldn't do it. I'll pay it back next week. They have a choice. You can say, I forgive you for not paying it back, because they broke their promise. So you can forgive them for not paying it back, but if you don't release them from the debt, it's still you. So whenever you look at them, they still owe you. You look at them as a someone who owes you money. And you can treat them and your heart changes towards them 
because you're suspicious, you don't trust them anymore. Everything changes in relationship when you have unforgiveness between people. So you have a second choice. You can actually say, yes, I forgive you from the fact that you didn't take that, but actually I'll cancel the debt. You don't owe it to me anymore. Now you have no right to look at them any differently because they don't owe you anything. But until you cancel with the debt, they still owe you. Now when we deal with things that forgive us in our lives, and let's say we're dealing with things with our parents, and they did some things or didn't do some things in our life that had a negative influence on them, and we say, well, you know, a lot of it gets rationalized, well, they didn't need it, and that stuff, because we never want to deal with it. Well, actually, you have to face it, and you've got to recognize they owe you. And they have done something that needs forgiveness. So you choose to forgive them. But then you have to weigh what they did and how it's affected the rest of your life. Because sometimes we can be fairly old and still be affected by the things that happened to us when we were children. Because we didn't learn to deal with the issues. So you have to deal with it and you have to weigh it up. Okay, they rejected me as a child and they made me feel insecure. And that's opened my life up for insecurity and fear and rejection and all my relationships have suffered because that was so new to me in my environmental nurture. So now I have an invoice. They didn't love me in a way that brought security. So, and that caused this relationship issue, that way of thinking, that behavior pattern. And you have to weigh up everything that that initial incident and the way they treated you has affected the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Set on the accounts and forgive them and release them from the debt. Now you are free to receive God's healing into that area in your life. You were never free until you released them. God whose hands were tied could not heal you or restore you because you held on to that. And then not only are you free, but you've released them. So God can now work in their lives. God can bring blessing into their lives and actually releasing them frees their heart. So it's really, really important to forgive and release people. And that's a side issue to what we do on the mountain, but I need to say it. So on the mountain, what we do is you are able to release and forgive other people's sin. You say, well, we can't do that. I'm not Catholic. Well, according to John, you can do it. Come on, preach. So, preach. So, we have mandates, call orders, authorizations, prophetic declarations. We can call things that be not as if they are. We do all those things. We can remove stumbling blocks and obstacles because we can move mountains. So, if there are blockages in our life, we can remove them. If they've got legal rights, we have to deal with the legal rights first, and then we can remove them. We can prepare a way to have to invade Earth by declaring and calling what we've cultivated in our heart. Also, if I share this point about desire, enables us to have authority, we release it. We can make base statements as well, though. We can send it to clear the clear atmosphere. But the keys of the kingdom, forgiveness, I want to express that. John 20, 23. If you forgive the sins of any, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they've been retained. Now, this obviously doesn't mean salvation, because someone has to choose to ask for salvation themselves, so they can be forgiven. So what does sin do in a person's life? Sin gives power to the enemy to cause a veil of darkness, blindness over them, so they can't see that light. Right. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ was given to God. Because the sin causes the enemy to have power. The enemy has no inherent power in the universe. God is the only power source of the universe, and he has delegated that power and authority to us. And only when we give it to the enemy does he have the authority. And of course, Adam and Eve gave him a lot of authority because they gave him their position of authority. But Jesus has come to claim back for that, so we now can deal with it. So sin causes blindness. John 20, 12, 40, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so they would not see with their eyes, perceive with their hearts, and be converted to healing. So there's a sense of being eyes blinded so that people cannot be saved and healed. 
Are declarations of forgiveness temporary or of blindness caused by sin? So, if you want to see someone saved, family member, people that God has given you some level of responsibility for, and you know those people, if they're part of your sphere of influence, you can forgive them. Every night when they are asleep, declare forgiveness over their life, particularly seek God for the revelation of what they're up to. But if you don't know, you can still, okay, I'm going to forgive them, their sins are causing them blindness. And then all night, the Holy Spirit and angels can have an to them because there's no sin to block their things. So they'll get dreams, they'll get visions, the Holy Spirit will start drawing them in the night. Now, you have to be consistent because when they wake up in the morning, they may start the cycle of sin all over again. And you have to do it that night. But actually, there's a resistance that gets broken down. And they're so far, they're drawn to the good news. And people come across their path and they find Christians everywhere. <laughs> And some of them get so annoyed. And they say to me, you Christians are everywhere. Everywhere you come across my path. Because it says, like, statistically, it says you probably have six or seven or so encounters with the gospel before you make a commitment. So we can prepare the way. We can also engage with their angels. Because they've got guardian angels. We can engage with their angels to start interacting with them to prepare the right people in the right situation so they'll come across the gospel. So forgiveness is a very powerful tool that we can use on our team to bring change and transformation into people's lives. Now, once one of the questions that people ask in this situation, can I bind someone against their will? Yes or no is the answer. Isn't it manipulation to try to bind somebody? You can only bind someone to the will of God for the loss, to their destiny, to salvation, because you know that's God's will. You cannot bind someone to make your life comfortable. You can't bind someone to give you money. You can't bind someone to marry you. You know, it's like, because you can get into some things in this stuff which can't be very manipulative and you in the flesh. But the reality is, you can bind someone to the will of God. And you can lose them from everything that's hindering them, including the unforgiveness and the sin they've got in their lives. So that they will actually be drawn to see the light and engage God. When the veil is removed and the gospel light comes in and engage God, now make sure they don't go into a religious institution that puts the veil back on. Yeah. Kingdom in the light. You know, I'm I am not praying for that many people to get saved right now. So I don't want them to come into an environment which is going to hinder them. So I'd rather my children and grandchildren who I want to follow the rules fully come into a church which was representing the fullness of the gospel. Because all my children make commitments when they were children, and they all got baptized in the spirit, baptized in water. But they saw how the church treated us, particularly my wife and I, and they didn't like it. So it inoculated us around. They haven't rejected God, but they've certainly rejected the system that they were brought up in. Right, you know, right. Because people treat people bad. Right. You know, and, you know, it doesn't bother me. I forgive and release people, and it's gone. So they didn't really understand how to do that properly, even though we try to teach them. And we're grateful that lots of times we've done different things. But I want people to come into a manifestation of the kingdom that's going to bring them into light. They won't be put under the religious bondage and stuff. That's why I encourage people to be under the cover and under a religious system which controls you. Come into the freedom and the light that's going to be there to release you into your destiny so that you can fulfill it. So it's important to see the understanding of biblical symbolism here because sometimes you get mountains and thrones and you get encounters and you don't understand what they are. Crowns. Crowns give you kingship, lordship, authority, mantles, cloaks, like Elijah, his mantle. Gave a double portion to Elisha when he picked it up. Scepters, symbols of kingdom authority like the rod, swords, spears, arrows. Sometimes you get given weapons. You know, usually those who get given swords get some kind of close and personal stuff to do. Those who get given spears, a little bit further away, you can throw those. <laughs> arrows, or you're laughing with arrows, because you can fire them a long distance. You know, sometimes people have arrows, they fire at it, and you know, God will show you what to do with things, you know. Because some of you may be called to influence the community. You do that with arrows. Orbs. Orbs are those little round things with 
thing that gives you authority to legislate. And keys. Sometimes you get keys. Seals. Now, when you start to come into the Lord Chancellor's wills and there's seals that give you authority to seal and authorize things to be released. So, what do I do? I sit on my throne, my mountain. You know, I have different mountains in one sense, but one throne. So, my throne is in charge of all the mountains are on. You know, I get to be a lot of them. This is my position in the kingdom. I can operate. All of my spheres, my seven mountains, my regional sphere, my ecclesial sphere, all those spheres, from my one place of who I am, authority, I start my lordship, I can move that into kingship, and I can go into sonship. It's still the same me, I'm just ruling the high level of authority. The throne can operate in any mountain as I mature. One throne, the rules of me. So by faith, in the spirit, so I don't really see anything. Don't worry, you don't need to see everything. Just need to faith engage it, and how it opens up will be resolved. You know, the seeing is not actually visually seeing all the time, it can be perception. It's, I'm so people ask, I can't see it. You can't see it. You're just thinking it has to be a full and technical Hollywood production. <laughs> <laughs> it actually isn't like that. You know, particularly with your eyes open. You know, I do most of my administration with my eyes open. So my spirit is seeing. You know, when we pull that veil back, the dark curtain, so like my spirit can engage and then inform me of what's going on. So my spirit is in heaven, I'm here, connected, and administrating. I'm not looking at it. I can't say a vision if I sort of thought about it and start to describe where I'm what I'm doing. I can describe it. I need to, because I know. That's what faith is. Faith you know. Whether you see or not. And I actually know, I have seen, and I can close my eyes and I can tune into it and see because I've practiced that a lot. But I'm trying to get people away from this. Wow, you can't see it. You can perceive and you can understand, which is really what it's about. So as your spirit draws from God and you know and have understanding in your spirit, then you can release that. Whether you're seeing it visually or not, don't get hung up on that. You know, by faith. You know, so many people say to me, well, I'm only doing it by faith. And they say, oh, for me, I can only do it by faith. Well, what do you think I do? I do it by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. God rewards those who come to him in faith. So you do it by faith, and you'll start to see results. Because your spirit will receive and perceive, and then you can release that perception in the things you say and the things you do and what you do in that realm. But don't get too caught up on it. You, know, you may have a trance and a vision and take it into it and have four other experiences that sort of kickstart your journey, but don't always look for those things. It doesn't always have to be an ecstatic experience. You know, I put on my mantle and crown and take my scepter or his lord, or, or sometimes I just hold my orb as a king. And I'm according to whatever I'm mandated to do, and this is really important, you have to have a mandate. You have to be all sorts. You can't just go and do what you want. What is God's will for me today? In alignment with my destiny, so I can have work that on my mountain. So I legislate, I declare, I call forth, I bind, I lose, I forgive, I sign angels. And all those things from that position of who I am as a Lord, King, and Son. It's not really that difficult, but we tend to make it difficult because we're trying to have something. And particularly, if some people sort of go around and they say, well, you can't have what you can't see. Well, you can, because you perceive it. You only need the perception, not the vision. Visual things are great, but they're not the end of it. So this is the invitation we have. When we open the door to him, Revelation 3.20, the whole, I stand at the door, not anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. I will die with him and you with me. There's a promise. You can hold that promise, open that door every day and experience that. When you do, it says, he who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne. As I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. How did he overcome? He went through the cross, he went into death, he was resurrected, and he had new life. So all we have to do to overcome is embrace him by being crucified with him on the cross, receive new life and resurrection every day, and 
sit down with them because we're raised with them in heavenly places. We don't have to do much. We just have to accept what's been done for us. So then we have a door, we have a throne in our life, we just have to invite him to sit on the throne. And then he, as we surrender the seat of the rest of the government, we give total control to him as a Lord. He sits on our throne, we step into him, on the throne in me, and then I will <coughs> with him to reign. And he trains me and equips me to do it in my journey. It's not necessary to have to know everything to start with. Just start where you are. You begin to do simple things around your life. You know, don't try the really big things to start with. You know, try the simple things, the little things you want to see change, the little things that God inspires you when you see His will. Then, of course, Revelation 4 1, here's the door standing open and having to come up here. We open, He opens. There's a throne. We can see it all. So you get this position of kingdom government. That's the mountain. That's your throne. You have a crown. There may be a few things flying around up there. You can see in the picture. Make sure you deal with that. I've got plenty of stuff on my mind. I've talked about how to deal with that. Um, and begin to administrate. It's, it's not, it really isn't that difficult, but we have to pursue it. Amen? We'll leave it there. Let's have a 20 minute break and we'll do it a little bit.